Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Cost Control in Construction. Today we're going to be talking about construction economics and we're going to be using a residential house case comparison that will show the effect that time has on development projects and how quickly you can return your profitability and what exactly is the difference between profit and return on investment. So we'll really be looking at there's to, a distinguishment to be made between profit and return on investment. So we'll talk a little bit about the business cycle, the uh, impact that interest rates have on construction financing, a little bit about present value, future value, compounding, and then we'll get into how that impacts the overall uh, project. Join me and we will advance with this topic. To have typical business cycles. Every business goes through this to one extent or another extent. And in the construction industry, we definitely feel this impact. Depending on the sector you're in, some areas might be more severe than others. Uh, there's a trough when we have a, a down market and there's this long growth cycle where we have sort of a booming economy, if you will. There's a point where it peaks out and then it usually goes negative into a recession. And it goes through that cycle again, a trough, growth, peak, and goes down towards a recession where it recedes. Now, how severe that might be uh, can be quite different from cycle to cycle. Sometimes it can be more of just a sort of shallow wave. Other times it can be quite uh, high and quite low. And then it also depends on the sector that you're in. Are you in new developments like housing and condominiums? That can be more severe. Uh, are you in a marketplace, uh, a city where mm, it's not really rapid growth and it's not rapid decline? it probably won't be as severe. So I kind of think about uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, we've had a long period of growth and uh, our recessions have not been that severe since about the year 2000. In the years 1990 to 96, it was quite severe and we had quite negative, uh, we had quite negative growth during that period. We had boom, boom times in the 80s, like 85 to 90 was really, everything was booming and growing. And then there was high interest rates at the time. Uh, there was uh, new government taxations. There was a, a downturn with a recession that really impacted people's ability to buy and invest. So we had a perfect storm going on during that time period and for a long period of time too, before the markets really uh, returned uh, to a positive area. It was difficult for people that were in the construction industry to get jobs during that time period. Conversely, in 2008, while North America, the United States had a really tough time with their, uh, with their residential markets and housing and a big, big crash, they had boom times before that, uh, we didn't have such a rough time. Our banks were relatively stable, our interest rates were low, and we had maybe about a three or four month sort of pause and everybody was kind of nervous with what was going on globally, but then we kind of came out of it relatively quickly and not um, negatively impact. It also has to depend on your government. Is the government pretty resilient? Uh, are they able to uh, improve cash flow into the economy and inject that so that it gets things kick-started. If the government is pretty good uh, with regards to um, doing Keynesian economics, that's a positive impact. If it's not too good, that's a negative uh, impact. Like the government of Greece, you know, you, they don't have uh, their own capital. They have the euro, right? So they can't necessarily uh, inject uh, money into their economy. It was much more difficult for them. Whereas uh, in Canada, 2008, we had a surplus overall going into that recession. So it was pretty easy to inject billions of dollars into uh, infrastructure projects, etc., that helped uh, the industry during that time period. Whereas in the early 1990s, unlike the United States, Canada was uh, really suffering that way. We had a lot of debt and it was a lot more difficult to inject liquidity into the 
marketplace and capital into the marketplace and fund infrastructure projects. So depends on the sector you're in, how, how, how much it goes into a trough, peak, recession. Uh, depends on a lot of factors, economic factors such as immigration, attractiveness of your, of your uh, city or town to this marketplace. And those are also impactful. So depending where you live globally, it can have uh, quite a different sort of uh, resonance. But for sure, construction industry, it definitely goes through economic cycles. So just because you enter and you get a job and a career in this uh, industry, don't think it's always uh, great and smooth sailing. Depends on the sector and understand the sector that you're dealing with. Interest rates obviously also have a big impact. Uh, you know, if we can't borrow money to uh, buy a house uh, because the interest rates are so high or we can't qualify, then that makes it very difficult to purchase. And so house prices are going to um, go down. Uh, that'll have that impact because people won't be able to sell them. And also developers may hold back on doing new developments because they can't pre-sell them. They can't get the financing to be able to go ahead with them. Many uh, financiers will want you know, 70, 80% of the development pre-sold before construction starts because uh, that helps to mitigate their risk uh, in those projects. So interest rates definitely have a uh, big impact. It also, you know, what is the interest rate for a 90-day treasury bill? That's usually what we consider the risk-free rate. You know, government T-bills, 90 days, it really looks at, well, can the government uh, stay afloat for the next 90 days? And, you know, in, develop, in the developed world, that's a pretty risk-free uh, kind of investment. You know, it's banked by the government of Canada. It's banked by the U.S. Uh, banking system, U.S. government. It's pretty resilient and strong. Now, there was a time period where, uh, like I'm going to use Greece as my ex example, my wife's Greek, and uh, there was a time period where government bonds at Greece, they were paying like 17, 18%. Not that, that long ago, very, very high rates. Why? Because it was teetering on whether they were going to fail as a government. So that's high risk, so then the rates are high. But that also uh, makes it hard to um, deal with other areas of the economy when you know the government uh, T-bill rates are that high. If you're a business and you're going to try to look at investing in a development, and you've got all this capital cash, you're thinking, all right, well, this investment in this development better return a lot more than what this interest rate is because I'm not taking any risk. If I just put it in T-bills, I'm going to get 19% this development, it's going to have to get a lot more than that because I'm taking a lot more risk if you're looking at it logically. So there should be some attachment to risk and reward. Uh, currently, interest rates are probably at their lowest uh, and you, you put money in a T-bill, you're getting next to nothing over 90 days uh, because the interest rates are so low overall. Banks, you, you invest in a you not invest, but you put in a savings account, high interest savings account. It's a kind of a misnomer, high interest savings account. It's paying you like maybe 0.1 of 1% uh, right now. It's very, very historically low. So you don't really want to do that because your money is probably losing its purchasing power with inflation. You leave it in there, it's actually worth less in a year from now because of purchasing power. You can purchase less. So even though, even though uh, uh, our inflation rates are historically low as well, they're still higher than the interest rates that those uh, savings, high interest savings accounts are paying. So what do you do, right? Well, that makes developments more attractive because it takes less uh, to make that seem more attractive. So if we're going to get a return of our investment of 15 or 20 percent, it's looking pretty good compared to 0.1 of a percent. Meaning that if you put $100,000 into this uh, investment, you're going to get $20,000 back instead of, what is that, $100 back for that $100,000 if it's at 0.1. That's, that's nothing, right? Uh, so, oh, okay, maybe that's worth the risk. 
and so you get more uh, things that are investments that are occurring. And that's partly why interest rates are low. Governments want investment into the economy to help the economy grow. Now, if the economy starts to grow too fast, they start worrying about hyperinflation and other things, so they'll slow it down. They'll raise the interest rates up a little bit to compensate for that. Uh, so we have to think about uh, long-term projects as well. In long-term projects are affected by uh, the inflation rate. Uh, if you're in a four or five year, six year project, uh, that can be uh, quite uh, impactful if inflation is moving fairly high. Again, it hasn't really been a problem over the last 20 years or so where it's been unpredictably high or there's been huge changes in it. So governments are conscious of that. Business likes predictability and governments try to stabilize things so that things are predictable that way. Can they always do it? No. Uh, there's a lot of economic factors that come into play, but that's what Bank of Canada, that's what uh, in the US uh, the government tries to do to ensure that uh, you have some predictability so it helps make people want to invest. Well, all of this ties to uh, a number of factors and one is the time value of money and the magic of compounding, if you will. There is a lot uh, to be said if you invest in something and you, you're able to get a decent return on that investment and reinvest it, it really can grow substantially. And if you think about how compounding um, works, it has a really high impact. If we think about how quickly money can double, it's not a bad way of looking at things. And there's the rule of 72. If you have a multiple of interest rate and time, like years, and it goes to 72, you double your money, roughly. So seven. Uh, so if you take uh, seven years at 10%, it's at 70. That's pretty close to 72. So 70, seven years at 10% will roughly double your money. Or 10% uh, at seven years will double your money. Big difference though, three years, right? So the amount of interest rate that it takes for you to double your money can be quite uh, substantial. Seven and 10, that's 70. What would it be if we took 72 and we uh, divided it by 12? So like 12 years, right? So if we took 72 and we divided it by 12, that's six years. Hmm, okay, so six times 12% uh, interest, six years, 12% interest. Uh, that would double our money or projects that we could get that kind of return on would double our money. So you got to look at those kind of things. And also you can think about it is, well, if I get 1% in the bank, how long would it take to double my money? 72 years, roughly a long time, right? So very, very low interest rates. Uh, you're not keeping up with inflation when inflation's going at 2%, you're falling drastically behind. And compounding really is, uh, it's good to picture it kind of uh, in a number of ways. And there's this old sort of fable, I think, with uh, uh, the king and there's this peasant and if they doubled, uh, the peasant wants to double a pea every month for a, um, every day for a month. And uh, it seems like a very small amount, but it turns out to be a very large amount. I think it works better if you picture it with pennies. So I did it with pennies. Uh, if you have 31 days in a month, uh, we'll pick one of the longer months because it makes a huge difference, as you'll see, and you were able to double your uh, penny every uh, day. So you go from one cents to two cents to four cents to eight cents to 16. It doesn't seem like it's going to be that much, and it isn't that much, but it's at a certain point, it really starts to take off. And this is the magic of compounding by being able to have that money reinvested and have it grow. Uh, it really starts to take off from a financial perspective, the compounding of that. So it's also why businesses look at, well, if I put this money in to a project and I've got to compare it to other potential projects I could do, what's my return on my investment? Is it is it 1%? Is it 10%? Is it 100%? And if I leverage it, can I get much more than just looking at it from a profit perspective? So there's two ways that we can look at projects. We can look at it from a profit perspective. We should, 
and we must, but we should also look at it from a return on investment perspective because we can see a, quite a dramatic difference and we can compare it to other potential investments that as a business we want to do, or we can say, okay, we want to pull back for now and we're just going to leave this in treasury bills, 90-day treasury bills. What would that pay us? And the difference, of course, is 90-day treasury bills you're about as good as you possibly can be at being what we call the risk-free rate, where we're not taking risk. Our projects, though, we can have very high returns, but we can also lose everything. There's risk. There's always risk when we're looking at development projects. So we look at this and we can sort of see as it goes along, look at this, it starts to, you know, around day 19, starts to accumulate and then we're seeing oh okay this is getting pretty good this is getting pretty good wow uh, this is really getting good one million oh then it's double so look at what goes on from say day 23 day 22 to day 31 even looking at from day 30 to day 31 look at how that that money doubling and compounding makes a significant difference so don't underestimate the miracle of compounding and how that can impact uh, your ability to make good returns on projects. There, so there's a number of uh, formulas that we can utilize. Uh, if we are looking at what's the future value of something, we take the present value and we multiply it by 1 plus i to the n. i is the interest rate and n is the number of terms. Uh, you can do number of terms in different ways, but we'll typically look at years. So that's one way, and you can, you know what, the easy way is you just get a financial calculate, a financial app, and it's so easy to put the information in, and it'll give you what the results are. So if I have so much money today, and I put this in, uh, uh, so whatever this amount, instead of $1, if it's $100,000, or a million dollars, or $10,000, plus the interest rate, over how many years, what is my return on that? You can, the nice thing about apps on this, you can just uh, do sensitivity analysis and try different numbers and see what the differences are. And it makes you think a little bit from that perspective. Uh, if we want to find out the present value, that's just operating in reverse. So it's divided. It's really what you're taking a future value and you're saying, if I wanted to have a million dollars in 10 years, right? Um, what would that require today? So what kind of investment would that require today at this interest rate for 10 years and uh, basically using one. So we basically, what's our future value, the million dollars divided by one plus I to the N, and what's our present value would be to figure out our future value. We just put that number there, plus one to I to the N. Well, I used to do this all the time, like manually calculating it or with a, a calculator with the, with the rate and it takes a lot of time. Like I said, there's so many apps, business uh, apps you can download for next to nothing, and they do it really, really well. Uh, so that's that's giving you a sense of the time value of money because you would see, you know, uh, the future value. You could really sort of see over time at a certain interest rate. All right, so it is five percent. Okay, it's ten percent get a good understanding of the time value of money and what it looks like and what the discounting of money also looks like to find present value. And then start thinking about next, I would, now that you're getting a good handle on that, I would start to think about return on investment. It's different than profit, right? So return on investment is how much money or capital as say a small custom home builder, did I have to put into this project to buy the land, right? And what is my return on investment on that? Not what's the profit. Profit is kind of like, okay, uh, we're gonna build this house and we're gonna sell it. And what did we pay to buy the house? What did we pay to buy the land or sort of buy the land and to build the house. So we've got all the direct costs of building the house. We've got all the costs of the land and the financing, all of that. And what did that cost? And what did we sell the house for? And if what it cost to buy it and build it is less than what we sold it for, then that difference there, and we're including all the costs in the other part, would be our profit. Okay, that's our profit. That'll be a different number than 
what did we invest of our capital? What did we tie up of our capital to build this project? And so what is our return on that investment? And that's basically what developers do because they don't put all cash typically on their projects. They leverage it with financing. Uh, so if I take an example here, let's say that we're a developer and we purchase a property and I've got very low numbers here, so don't worry about that. This is from uh, the book that I uh, did, the project management plan scheduling. So I had to kind of uh, cater to properties that might be not necessarily in Toronto, they might be in Nova Scotia or they might be in uh, some uh, rural part of the Midwest in the United States. So the amounts are much lower. You know, Toronto or New York or something, you're, you're paying just for the property one and a half, two million dollars maybe if it's in a, in a city. Uh, so you just have to adjust for that. It doesn't really change any of what we're discussing here though. You can change the numbers very easily at a zero, whatever. A developer purchases a property for $100,000 in order to build a new 3,000 square foot house at a cost of $150 a square foot. Probably in Toronto right now, it would probably, and this dates and changes as uh, uh, times change. Probably in the, for a custom home, probably you're looking at $250 to $300 a square foot, depending on the finishes and what you're doing. Uh, and they are then able to construct and sell the newly built house for $650,000 within one year of purchasing. So key, key points here are 100,000, right? Purchases a property for 100,000 in order to build a new 3,000 square foot house at $150 per square foot. So that should be about 450,000 um, to, uh, to build it, right? And a hundred plus the hundred thousand you paid to purchase it, and then they're going to sell it for six hundred and fifty thousand within one year of purchasing the house. The developer invested a hundred thousand of their own capital in this project and financed the rest. All costs include financing and the price per square foot. I'm trying to keep it simple, so if you're keeping all of those costs in there. Uh, what is the developer's return on? investment for the project as a percentage. So let's take a look at how we would calculate that. We have 100,000 purchase price of the land. Like I said, $150 times 3,000, 450,000 to build. So 450 plus 100, 500,000 dollars. 650 is the sale price minus 550 cost. That equals $100,000. So we put 100,000 in, we got 100,000 back. That would 100 divided by 100, that equals one or 100% return on our investment. We got 100% return on that investment. If we put that money in the bank instead and we got 1%, we would get, in that year, we would get $1,000. So the difference is 1% taking that money because you've got to look at what could I, what are my other opportunities of using this capital. And if I took the, the uh, most safe way of putting it in the bank or say a treasury bill, 90 day treasury bill, if I was able to get 1% on that over a year, because that's the time period that it took, that would be $1,000. And like I said, currently it's more like 0.1 of a percent, right? So it's next to nothing that you would be getting like a hundred dollars compared to a hundred thousand dollars profit on this particular project is uh, if we look at profit on sales which is as follow profit is a in this case a hundred thousand uh, dollars but we're looking at it for a percentage purpose it's only 15.38 percent profit on sales so we take that uh, 100,000 divided by the 650. So profit is 15.38% of sales. Return on investment is 100%. Just telling you there's a difference between profit, how we look at that, and return on investment. Because if I'm a developer, I'm looking at what's the return on my capital? What can I get from this? How can I leverage this? This is a very important concept to get through. It's a big difference when you're deciding, what do I do? You know, if you're just looking at profit on the overall sales, it's not 
quite as attractive because don't forget there's risk involved. If the market drops and this house uh, sells for 550,000 instead of 650, your 100,000 is gone. Like it's gone. You've lost it, right? And there's easy markets where the house could drop. You know, that would probably involve a, a drop of uh, less than uh, 20%. That'd probably involve a drop of around 15% or so, 15.38. It's easy that that could drop uh, in that marketplace for sure. Uh, it doesn't happen that often, but if you're in the middle of it, that would be a disaster for you, especially if it was your life savings and you were putting that in. So I'm not trying to paint this purely rosy picture here. I'm telling you, you have to watch what you're investing in and the time frame does matter. And the longer it takes you to build, the more likelihood something could happen in the middle of that process. So that's something to consider because now we're going to take a look at, well, this really sort of hit home on how you can leverage uh, your capital and why you see b builders and developers will um, really put a, an emphasis on time to build. So let's try a different example. Um, so we use the same example above, except in this scenario, the house is taking a lot longer to construct. It's taken you 18 months to be exact. The project ran behind schedule, and as a result, there were a number of cost overruns, including the extra cost of financing, property taxes, inflationary costs, totaling an extra $40,000. Also, the real estate market softened somewhat, depressing the sale price um, by $30,000 to $620,000. So if we put those numbers into play, $100,000 purchase price of the land, $150 square foot times $3,000. We've got some extra costs involved. So now it's not four fifty; dollars it's $490,000. Uh, $490,000 plus the $100,000 to buy the land. The land price was the same, $590,000. Uh, $620,000 is the sale price, $620 minus $590,000. So we got $30,000. We're still a little bit ahead. Uh, so 0.3 or 30% return on investment. We still got a 30% return on our investment. It's not 100%. It's still okay. You took a lot of risks with this and you might have had some sleepless nights as things were going forward and you were falling behind on the schedule. Uh, but uh, definitely it's still positive. But you can see the effect that a few little things changing. I could have made some of these things more drastic or more dramatic, uh, and it wouldn't have taken much to have lost that that little difference of thirty thousand, right? I could have said that this was seventy thousand extra costs, or I could have said this was fifty thousand extra costs, and the market softened and it was six hundred, and then there we we're not we're not getting anything back, right? So you could look at it in different ways. Uh, so that's showing you also the profit. We've got 4.8% profit on sales. We take the 30,000 divided by 620. Uh, so that's 4.8% profit on sales. So it's a much tighter margin there. But I would definitely be looking at that re ROI return on that investment critically. And that tells you something. It tells you how you should be looking at the time value that's instigated in a project and how there's some, especially development projects, there can be some advantages to shortening the time. Now, huh, in a very booming marketplace, remember we looked at how the cycle goes in a booming marketplace, you know what? You could run these numbers different ways. That's the nice thing. You could run these numbers a number of different ways. What if in a booming market, it took you longer, but now the sale price instead of 620 was 820? because the market just took off. You could run those numbers and they would be really, really, really good. So sometimes uh, builders and developers, if they take longer than they thought, it actually doesn't work out that negative for them. And if you remember earlier in the course, we talked about uh, decision-making and probabilities and that sort of thing. And uh, we talked about I think the Annie Duke uh, uh, comments from uh, her book, Thinking in Bets, just because you ran the red light and you got to the other side doesn't mean it was a good decision. Just because you got lucky this time, your project took longer and you didn't manage it that well, but the market went up, doesn't mean that was a good decision. If you do it all the time, you're probably going to get caught at certain points. 
Uh, so you still want to keep in mind the uh, efficiency and effectiveness of it. It's a different story if you were able to finish it, but you see the market's rising. So you maybe ask a higher price and it takes longer to sell till it reaches that price. Uh, those are other decisions that can be made. But I think it's really good to understand the difference between return on investment. As another example, let's try this one. Uh, we take our uh, original example, except in this scenario, the house was constructed in six months instead of a year. With the extra proceeds, they reinvested it in the construction of a second house. Uh, so for the simplicity, we kept the second house the same, all the numbers, so you could see it better. So they take the money from the six months that they got, they throw it back into the next house, and then that's giving you an indication of uh, the profitability or the return on investment when you do it faster. The, first, uh, the second scenario, we looked if it takes longer. Now we're talking about if we did it faster. So the developer purchases the property for 100,000, 3,000 square foot uh, homes. House one in the first six months with the initial investment reinvests. The second house is completed in the second six months. Both houses are built at a cost of $150, and we run through these numbers, uh, and let's see. So, $100,000 purchase of land, $100,000 a second. We don't purchase this one until the first one is done, $450 for each house, and we're able to turn over this one in the first six months, this one in the second uh, six months. Total cost of both houses, $1,100,000. 650 sale price of house one plus 650 sale price of house two. Minus one million one hundred thousand in cost equals two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand divided by one hundred thousand equals two. That's our original um, overall investment of our money being tied up over the entire year. It's only tied up. The hundred thousand was only tied up once over the hundred years. We're not uh, over the year. We're not needing two hundred thousand. It's just we're building the house twice, two houses in one year. So we have a two hundred percent return on that investment. Big difference, big difference. We were able to shorten the timeline and improve that uh, cycle. So in development, that is something that is considered and that is a big deal. You see pr big production home builders, the money from one house goes into the next house, goes into the next house. They don't start a thousand houses at once. They have them cycling through so they can reinvest that money uh, into the next ones. And then if they can shorten the cycle, then that's very uh, profitable for them. But what did we talk about earlier in the course? We talked about time, cost, right, quality. Well, you don't want to shorten the cycle so much that this house is a disaster and you've got uh, tens of thousands of dollars of quality issues and delays and other things. You've got to be very cognizant of that balance that goes on. But if you can build the systems around shortening the cycle time, you mitigate a lot of your risk and you can improve that return on investment by reusing that capital in other projects. So when we think about controlling costs, there's a lot to think about there. A lot to think about. It's If we look at a schedule and we kind of look at house one, there's our 100% return on investment with that cycle. House two or house B, uh, so that's our 30% and our Example C, I don't know why I got 1A, 1A, 1A. This is 1A, 1B, 1C. We've got 200%. Just think about that. And it doesn't have to be exactly that, right? I just use nice, even numbers. So it might be the difference between getting this. You're, you're going to improve your, your capital uh, usage, your return on investment by, by shortening this by one month or by two months to 10 months. It's still going to be a, a big improvement. Uh, in your return on investment. It doesn't have to be um, exactly that you're doing two houses in a year. But it is something to think about. And it, conversely, if it takes you two years to build one house, that is something to think about as well. Unless you're fortunate enough that you're building it in this really up market, then that can be a positive as well. Uh, but all markets at some point do change in the cycle. And just because we've been in a very good cycle for 20 plus years uh, in our particular local environment, there's plenty of environments where that has not been the case. So anybody graduating and having taking programs like this and, and courses like this, 
Just because it's really good now doesn't mean it's good always. So think about your own savings and how you should have a good sort of safety fund and how that can compound with the right investments uh, for itself. And you have to consider those elements as a business too. Uh, I talk about the book Good to Great and I just did a little uh, video on uh, a book club on, on Good to Great, which is an excellent book. And the companies discussed in Good to Great, some of them are good to great to gone. And a lot of it has to do with how they got caught in some of those business cycles. So that's why you see that a lot in construction, especially with development companies. If they put a lot out there and something occurs in the economy that's outside their financial model, uh, it causes a lot of grief for them. And it can cause a lot of bankruptcies, etc. But when the things are good and they've done the model and things are working within the model, things are really good. Keep that in mind. Reflective questions. How do interest rates affect the cost of construction? Well, it's affordability. Uh, it, the time frame, if you're financing it, so if you put $100,000 into those properties, but you're financing the rest, higher interest rates make it more difficult to finance and it tightens up uh, your cost structure. So you want to factor that in. Uh, inflation is important, a long-term project. Maybe you want to have clauses in the contract that will put what you're purchasing measured against a consumer price index or certain commodities that might be involved. We've had, free, we've had trade wars, etc., and that can dramatically imp impact your profitability if you don't have some contingencies in place. These are, are things that are outside your control, but if you, in the contract you may put some controls in place, it may offer you certain protections. Or you may want to discuss hedging certain commodities as a result of potential ups and downs in those commodities on long, long projects. What is the difference between the future value and present value of money? Well, one is how much is it going to grow over time? Uh, so, And the other is taking an amount in the future and discounting it. So what would I need to invest today to end up with that amount in the future? Gives you a good perspective on the time value of money. And I would say it would be very worth your while to download one of those very low cost financial calculators because you can run all these different numbers uh, in them and they'll do mortgages and everything else. And it's very, very helpful for understanding the time value of money because it's in everything. Uh, how does uh, knowing the return on investment for each construction project help owners compare different projects? Well, when I put that hundred thousand dollars, if that's what this company has, or if it's a one million, or if it's ten million, or a hundred million, whatever it is, that is tying up that capital on this project. So I have the lost opportunity of other projects that I could have used that. So if this project is going to give me a 30% return on investment, whereas this one's going to give me a 200% investment, well, all things being equal, I should go for the 200%. Unless that 200% investment is going to have a lot higher risk, then I've got to decide, is this worth the risk? Is this going to sink the company? What kind of impact could that potentially have? And generally, there should be that risk-reward. Greater, greater rewards usually come with greater risks, but not always. You may find that there's opportunities and developers are always looking for those opportunities and trying to mitigate the risk as much as possible. So hopefully that's given you a good sense of the time value of money, the difference between profit and return on investment and how developers think and how cost, controlling costs on the project and shortening time periods on the project can really impact the return on investment for developments. So I'm Tom Stevenson, wishing you a wonderful day and we'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.